We are here for another episode of EV Obsession post Thanksgiving. This is uh, really a packed schedule, but it's sort of there's a couple of themes in the. So it's like there's several stories we're going to touch on, but it's really a, a few different themes. Let's get in with a screen share. The first story is is the one that's outside of any theme. It's just a fun, cool heavy duty electric vehicle story that you wrote that we have to start with because it, I think we should always start with something fun and cool. Yeah, this is really cool. This is a uh, Yanmar HD. They have put together this, uh, you know, all electric excavator. And what's really interesting about this is even with an electric drive unit, a lot of excavators, a lot of heavy equipment still use hydraulic systems to move the boom arms, to raise and lower the buckets and things like that. This is full electric. This is electric motors at every point of articulation, but also interesting is it uses force control. So what does that mean? That means that it can very accurately and with precision apply a certain amount of torque to these electric motors so that if it's mining or if it's in some kind of scenario where they're not a hundred percent sure what's underneath the surface, they can run into something that's you know, more dense or that's heavier load or even lighter than expected. And that feedback will come back in to the operating system and say, okay, we need to modify the amount of force that we're using. We need to modify how we're approaching this. This was done in concert with the Japanese space agency. A lot of this technology is uh, being looked at in terms of mining satellites and asteroids and getting materials off of those. So it's really neat, really interesting stuff. And uh, yeah, just kind of fun and cool to see this stuff coming out into the real world. Yeah, I love it. I just love any new electric vehicle application, but this is a particularly interesting and fun one. Uh, so we'll move on to really, you know, one of the biggest core aspects of the EV industry is the EV battery industry. Where are those batteries being produced? How much is that changing? Uh, so Again, as I think anyone who's looked into this knows, China leads or even dominates electric vehicle battery production in Q3 2023. That was the case again with, you can see that the bar here where China is a, almost quadruple the production capacity, production and capacity output of the number two country, which is the United States. If you dig in, it's, it's pretty interesting. You have... Um, massive growth so overall the ev battery industry was up 45 percent uh last last quarter compared to the the year before uh so you have just all all of these mark all of these countries are growing fast uh but the us which is or, well we start with china china was dropped from 58 percent of the global ev battery market to 54 percent pretty notable four percentage point drop year over year, but it's still above 50%. I think that's really just, it's just indicative of the fact that more countries are getting serious about electric vehicles, EV sales, EV production, and then local EV battery production as well. So just as the market matures and evolves, more places will produce batteries. So when we look at, you know, oh, China dominates EV battery production, I think what's often forgotten is China also dominates EV sales. It accounts for over 50% of EV sales. So it might look like, oh, China is producing batteries for everyone. It's like, well, China might is pro is primarily producing batteries for itself. <laughs> so this is right. like, this is logical. Um, but yeah, it's good to see the U.S., was up 49% uh, compared to Q3 2022, so almost a 50% increase, went from 14% of the market to 15%, and Germany was uh, was up 51%, uh, similar, about 50% increase. The UK was up 50%, so all of these other major markets are growing about 50% a year um, in their production output. Uh, and then France was fifth. So just really overall, all all markets growing, tremendous results. Um, the interesting thing, so those other markets were up 50%. China was only up 30% compared to the third quarter of last year. So you can see everyone's sort of catching up a little bit, but, um, but China still dominates. Fun stuff. I love, this is my favorite kind of, ah, it's my favorite kind of story. I love looking at these market reports like this. Yeah, I mean, there's not really much to add there. I mean, you can see the rest of the world is starting to catch up a little bit with China. I think also China's push for 
plug in hybrids and hybrid vehicles is misleading a little bit with this, even though the uh, battery capacity being deployed to that market share is reducing. I think the number of miles being driven on electric power instead of uh, fossil fuels is actually probably uh, still growing in China, even though their overall capacity is growing at a slower pace. But um, yeah, great stuff. Great to see it. Yeah, they have plug-in hybrids, but much longer range than the plug-in hybrids. We see much bigger batteries in, in the in U.S. and Europe, typically. So this is a fascinating story that just completely from Jennifer Sensaba here on Clean Technica. Uh, it's, I think you really have to read the story and dig in to get it all. But basically, you know, if you if you do a search on electric vehicles on YouTube, you get a lot of crap results. And it takes a while often before you find a pro or positive EV YouTube video. I mean, of course, this is going to vary depending on your YouTube history, what you, you know, all kinds of stuff that they're tracking on you. But she tried it for her own account and not tracked on a on a incognito account, and it took her a long time to get down to like a a deep a big debunking article from I think that's fully charged, yeah, that's debunking a lot of stuff. But what she found was just similarities in in these type of uh in all these type of anti-ev videos saying like volkswagen's not producing uh, dropping evs ford's dropping evs gm's dropping evs in a in a like brand by brand all of these companies are dropping evs kind of way it's clearly like this is clearly funded dark money anti-ev campaign funded by who knows you know could be I mean, could be Russia, could be uh, Saudi. Yeah, I don't think you need could to be... go that deeply into it. it could yeah, you be don't. The we can't identify things. who it was. Yeah, it's just the the point is, someone's got a camp, a big anti EV campaign. These are not small views; like they're tens of no. thousands or even a hundred thousand views per video. So they're either very effective at gaming the the YouTube algorithm, which is what she's sort of pointing out. Or they're also like, you know, paying to have them shown to people, you know, they're, they're sponsored. In any case, it's clear that someone that there's a very big concerted effort to spread anti EV propaganda on YouTube, and I'm sure TikTok as well. And something to look out for, especially as you know, you listen to us and our propaganda. <laughs> well, I think it's important to note here that it's not just surrounding the EV space. There's a ton of similar yeah. type of propaganda about just about everything, whether it's Obamacare, universal health care, insurance, labor rights. There is a very, very strong, concerted and professional effort from these right wing fascist douchebags trying to promote a really horrible agenda. And it was funny, I was looking at our YouTube comments and somebody posted, you guys need to stop talking politics. You're not going to make any friends. And honestly, I want to go on the record as saying, dude, if you're like an anti-EV, anti-healthcare, anti-immigration, you know, ultra conservative, anti-gay, LGBTQIA, anti, you know, whatever, I don't want to be your friend. So please check the F out. Yeah, I, I don't know if that was one of those early comments that you're referring to or a recent it one. It was. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. Very, we very about early Hillary. comment. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think in general, yeah, people want you to fit in a box. And that's sort of what you what this story tells us, too. YouTube is like, do you fit in this box of what people want to see? And it's either like, oh, I want to be fed more, more, uh, you know, just hyper focused pro Tesla content, or I just plus sized bikini models. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I'm gonna get that in my in my uh, YouTube. You're feed gonna love from, it. From, <laughs> but or you know, I just want to be fed you know anti liberal stuff, or I just want to be fed anti EV stuff, or I just want to be fed pro Ford stuff. Like it's all, you know, what it's just once you there's there's certain boxes that just get really more dominant more popular like the pro i sent you a video i don't think you opened it yet right i did not know yeah so it's a, it's a little test i have a little test there i will just yeah we'll come back to it offline but no, I, what's I the just, test tell me the test well i mean i, I was curious okay we're gonna do this <laughs> all right let's watch the video and i'll give you no. my live updates <laughs> no we're gonna do it i we 
I have been pro Tesla for ages. I have a Tesla. I have Tesla stock. I love Tesla as a company. In the past few years, you have to be so pro Tesla or you're kicked out of the community. You're like, you're like, you're not yeah. a believer. You're out. I sent you yeah, a video. Of, I sent you a video of just another YouTube. I'd never even seen this guy before. I don't know if he's new or he's popular on YouTube, but just doing a, a typical, he does an all Tesla video. And I was just curious how long you could last watching it because there's so much of this, but this one really stood out. And there's so much of this out there where, and it all comes down to, it's always about the stock. That's like all it's about for people these days. It's always about the stock. It's never about the mission anymore. It's not about being inclusive. It's about being exclusive and your stock going up. And I just think it's, it's really, it's just like, it, I feel bad that this is what it's come to, that it's for so many people, it's only about the stock price going up. That's what so much of the, like 95% of the, of the social media discussion around Tesla is about the stock now. And it used to just be about the company and people had the stock and whatever they were, you know, the, against the man, against, you know, the big guys. They were going to win just like they did with Apple or whoever, some of them. And it was a fun story on that side, but it wasn't always all the time about the stock. And I just, you know, this sort of matches, like you've got this anti-EV theme that's very popular. So much of the Tesla discussion on YouTube is just about whether or not the stock is going to go up and why this, really, it's just why the stock is going to go up. It's not about whether or not it's going to go up. It's always about why it's going to go up. It's only about why it's going to go up. Or you can find, I'm sure some people can find the anti-Tesla uh, bo box where it's always about why it's going to go down. But <laughs> but it's just like, can we just- I think I get some stories? of those. Can we cover the pros and cons? Can we be real? Can we be honest about the pros and cons of, of all of these companies and, and technologies and not just be- focus on one thing saying that the stock is going to go up. So I, I just feel like, you know, we, we get some people who are like, Oh, this is not the, what I expected from clean Technica. I thought they were pro Tesla. We are, I'm, we are pro Tesla, <laughs> but we're also pro realism and pro having an open discussion that isn't all only about telling everybody the stock is going to go up tomorrow. So that's my rant. Right. But, uh, but I, the title of this episode is going to be Tesla stock is going down here. <laughs> no, no, it won't. But <laughs> we should do that as a test to see how it does. Yeah, but I mean, beware, watch out. And it's not just watch out for scams on YouTube. Watch out for getting in a bubble where you're only hearing one thing because that's what you want to hear. Like, like try to learn. Like, I think, you know, we're trying to learn. We're trying to investigate yes. and learn and not not only do something because we want we want that, but, you know, try to understand it. We also have a cool, fun break here for our Clean Technica wish book. And can you give the background for why this image is so fuzzy and what, what's going on with this old school image on the, on the top here? Yeah, so this was kind of inspired by the old Sears Christmas catalogs that would come out in the 70s and 80s. So if you were a kid in that era, so like me and Steve, right? Everybody else is too young. But, uh, you know, if you were a kid in that era, you would wait and it would always come around Thanksgiving and it would be this massive 500 page catalog of like toys and clothes and things like that. And the thing that was so crazy is because this was a pre-internet era, this would be the time that you would see, oh, there's a new He-Man toy. This would be the first time that you ever heard of Transformers would be through the Sears catalog. And it was so exciting and so fun. And you would open it up and they would have kids that were, you know, a picture of little Billy and little Billy would say this year for Christmas, I want this He-Man thing. And last year I was all about baseball and GI Joe. And not only would you as a kid go through this and kind of pick your favorites and, you know, write out your list for Santa, but as a parent, you would identify with these kids and be like, Oh, I have a little Billy of my own. And last year he loved GI Joe. So this year, I guess I'm supposed to buy him He-Man stuff. So we kind of had this inspiration to do this. We talked with uh, Electric, who's a manufacturer of e-bikes that we have a really good relationship with. They were all on board with this. They wanted to collaborate with it. So uh, they ended up sponsoring this with us this year. So we have some Electric ads in there. And uh, yeah, it's just some of the key Clean Technica staff, some people from Electric that are good friends of ours. And we went through and said, this is the kind of stuff that uh, 
you know, we want. So if you're looking at this and you're going, man, I don't, you know, I want to partake in capitalism and buy stuff for people and throw it under a tree or a holiday menorah or something. You can go through this and say, yeah, I know someone who's just like Danielle and who is into outdoorsy stuff. These are great gift ideas. I know someone who's just like Derek and likes to shoot stuff. This might be good stuff for Derek, you know, for, for the Derek in my life. So we go down the line. We've got, uh, you know, Scott Cooney, the founder. We've got Zachary here, my uh, guest host on the show. And uh, just kind of go through it all and, and see what's there. Yes, host. Oh, I know my. you like that. Yeah. Well, I was just. That's my friend. Oh, go down a little bit. This is Tyus. She's awesome. I met her in Arizona. Oh, it's lagging. Hold on a second. Yeah. I just, yeah. I scrolled real quick to the top. But um, yeah, a oh, couple of things to emphasize. In there too. It's great stuff. A couple of things to emphasize is yeah, this is not about, hey, order these presents for us, although we won't mind. But oh yeah, <laughs> you, you can absolutely to, order stuff. You don't even know where to care. send it. But it's really like you, like Joe said, it's about like oh this this we have a description of each of us, you know who, who we are, what you know our profile, and you know you get different ideas for good presents. You can get someone uh, who is uh, like, like that. Right? Yeah, and so there's just a lot of that. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and there's a lot of cool products. Like I love the I love what I'm seeing on other people's lists. Uh, <laughs> Here's Vivo Boris. Uh, and I, oh, on the Tesla front, I would note for the past like three or four years, I've it's been a running joke in our family. Like, I hope I get a Tesla Cybertruck for Christmas. So on, you know, the whole Tesla thing again, like it's not <laughs> like I love a Cybertruck for Christmas. That would be great. Or the Cyber Quad, which is awesome. It's back in back in business. You can buy it again. I guess it was not sold for several months because a mom rode on it with her son and tipped over and like sued or threatened to sue Tesla because uh, she somehow didn't know that even though there's a weight limit that she can't ride it with her kid and not tip over. But uh, <laughs> this is, this is the world we live in. We got more kid ideas here from Wally and yeah. And I I just want to yeah point out like up at the top, some cool stuff here. Uh, every that aura ring is cool, by the way. Everybody's Christian yeah. turned me onto that. That was really I know. Neat. Everybody's list is introducing me to stuff I didn't know about that I'm like, oh yeah, I want that too. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to point out that Joe here is like trying to get extra presents with like ex like multiple holidays checked. He's like, yeah, give me presents for this holiday, this holiday, Joe Banza. <laughs> yeah. No, this is just this is Joe. And then he's he's like, oh, I'll send you a, a bag of a bag of poop for Christmas. And I was like, oh, thanks, Joe. It's a Tupperware of poop. Oh, Tupperware. <laughs> no, no. This is after he actually. I would I would be honest. He he generously asked for my address so he could send us a a card. Uh, and and I didn't want to give it. I didn't want him to send me anything. And he said, so I'm going to send you a Tupperware of poop <laughs> or something like that. Oh, I love it. it made my day. Uh, so. We're moving on. That's that a gift guide. Check it out. It's really just fun inspiration for what you could get someone in your life. Um, uh, this is another original from Jennifer. Another way to improve EV charging stations. Architecture. This is brilliant. I mean, this is I. I, I worked with like a dozen major EV charging companies and uh, nonprofits and and gov and different um, groups in Europe about. I don't know, six, seven years years ago on creating an EV charging guide for cities, how EV charge, you know, how they should approach EV charging stations. There needs to be much more fo focus on the aesthetics and the 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 comfort there, the you know, catching people's eye, making it a nice place to be. Uh, I've emphasized this, but it just doesn't really it's just very hard to get implemented, I guess. Charging stations are always struggling to make money, so they don't go above and beyond and put extra networks don't put extra stuff around to make it more appealing um but it's really if we want to like this is if this is going to be the future of our transportation life we need nicer stations and like people should focus on that i will say there's one company our friend kanan boss has been with clean technica um uh to to a degree for for years he works for fastnet in, in the netherlands and europe and this is the one company that really does a phenomenal job of making every station nice, really approaching with with attractive architecture that's useful, comfortable. But yeah, I mean, 
this needs to be a focus and it's just being left behind. And and we've been saying that for years, but good on Jennifer to bring it up again. Yeah, I agree completely. You can't just put chargers in the ground and stations in the ground and put them in the back of a parking lot with no roof, no protection, no amenities and expect people to want to use them. It doesn't work that way. And, um, and yeah, so many it's not companies, gonna work that way. They're like, we're just gonna place them in the best, most appealing like shopping areas we can, which is fine. There's a good step forward. Like, like every charging station network is doing that. But yeah, it's one thing to just stick poles in the dark corner of the parking lot versus like make a station that's like appealing and comfortable and feels safe. And so, yeah, we need to get better at that. Moving on, so this is a, this is the beginning of like a, a a bulk of stories that sort of are about a, a similar thing. So this one just BYD produced its six millionth plug-in vehicle, uh, just passed that milestone. The most notable thing from this is that this comes just three months after it produced its five millionth plug-in vehicle. So it went from five. That's crazy. To six in three months. So it's here, it's 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 dominating, it's it's leading the plug-in vehicle market. It's neck and neck with Tesla in the pure battery electric vehicle market. Uh, interestingly, this is a plug-in hybrid that got that was the uh the six millionth, but they I mean BYD primarily sells well, only sells plug-in vehicles and it's it's emphasized um battery electrics more and more, but it sees and sees markets for plug-in hybrids, including in the Philippines, where it's just introducing the full electric Ato 3 and uh, preparing 19 dealers in the Philippines for for charging state for for selling EVs, putting 100 charging stations in the Philippines. So this these two are tied because what BYD is doing is it's selling a ton in China, but it's selling more and more places and it's going in with force. So it's going into Philippines. It's not just bringing a model. It's coming to the, to 19 dealers and we're training them. It's putting in 100 charging stations. It's building, it's it's in places it's going pure electric and others is adding plug-in hybrid options depending on the market to help people get into that life. And it's just, I mean, this is leading. So I'm just really enthusiastic about what BYD is doing. Yeah, they're going to be coming strong, uh, not only Southeast Asia, Australia, but also Europe. And when they do make the move to America, it's going to be... Uh... It's going to be game over for somebody because oh, the reality is not every company is going to survive this. So, you know, maybe it's Mazda, maybe it's Mitsubishi, maybe it's Jaguar Land Rover. There's going to be some heads roll and um, it'll be interesting to see who they are. That looks like an appealing charging station design back there, doesn't it? I mean, no, it's not it's just a sales floor, but yeah. But on that topic, you brought this yeah, one this to the table. This is. Yeah, so the common refrain that you hear from a lot of people who are kind of naysayers on the Chinese industrialization front is, well, China doesn't really build quality products. They build disposable EVs. They build you know low quality junk, basically. Now, most of the people who say that are tweeting it from an iPhone or a MacBook Pro, which is made in China, and they have that irony is completely lost on them regardless. Chinese build good stuff. And then now we have BYD and the Volvo EX30, uh, the BYD Seal. These are both Chinese built cars and they are finalists for car of the year in Europe in, for 2024. These are incredibly well-built vehicles and uh, you know they're at the top of the heap. And we're talking in a market that has Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Volkswagen, these kind of paragons of vehicle quality and engineering quality. They are, uh, you know, they're up against the Chinese here and they may not win. So I, I think it's really worth noting here that this is a big step for China. And if a Chinese, maybe it's not going to be this year, but the first time that a Chinese vehicle wins this, it's going to really sound some alarm bells to any U.S. automaker who's paying attention. Yeah, I mean, first, I mean, of course, it's already alarm bells in in, in Europe, with in Germany, they're, where they're trying to sort of block Chinese uh, EVs. Yeah. Well, I the the headline is a little misleading because it makes you. I don't know. I I was just thinking. Um, they're finalists. Well, I'm, I'm confused because here it says, as we reported, seven Chinese vehicles became oh candidates. Oh yes, so seven became candidates out right. of twenty eight. 
final candidates it was a stage before finalists and uh so 25 percent of the the candidates um were from china and two ended up being finalists so yeah i i mean um frankly i love the ex30 but i would give it i would give the title to the byd seal it's just uh it's a transformative amazing vehicle i didn't think at all five or ten years ago that byd would produce vehicles this attractive and good in such a like that it would change its that it would have so many different options and that it would have such appealing options um because i i mean we we talked up the chin and the tang but i was like ah these have to come to North America. They have to come to Europe. They're going to be big sellers, but I didn't want one, but, right. but I would like a seal. Like that is really good. I would rename it because I'm no way I'm driving yeah, a car called it. a seal, but it's, I was going to say, I'm holding out for the sea otter myself. Yeah, exactly. But it's big, big news and we'll see who wins. Um, so the, the theme now is sort of just the global spread of EVs. Um, we have a few stories on that front. This is uh, DHL Express in South Africa is getting Volkswagen ID Buzz cargo vans to to test for test fleets. Yeah, uh, I love this because it's well. so visible. This is such a highly visible thing. They're bright yellow. DHL is going to stop in front of everybody's houses. Can you imagine if Amazon did this and people are having all their products dropped off with ID Buzzes or like maybe Amazon groceries, Amazon fresh deliveries? were happening with uh you know vw buzz evs that would be huge what a tremendous marketing campaign that would be for volkswagen i would love to see that yeah my friend david havasi just saw a trailer of amazon rivian amazon vehicles uh on the interstate and spotted it on going under the interstate got a dash cam photo from his tesla of it and sent it over <laughs> so it's That's a cool. fun story, but it's just, you know, a fuzzy picture with, you know, a bunch of uh, several Amaz Rivian Amazon trucks, but they're not, they don't stand out like to me. Like it, it's like, it's like, I see the Walmart um, Ford EV delivery vans all over now, but they don't stand out a lot. I love that the buzz is very identifiably different, stands out a lot. And uh, yeah, the yellow, of course, but I, I don't see how this doesn't go well. And I would love to see the buzz used like worldwide for this kind of thing, right? Yeah, I think so. So on that expansion front, Tesla's opening some superchargers in South Korea to all EVs. Uh, it was just a simple tweet, but I mean, this has been the question that I've had for, for since it became a common in the US for other automakers to adopt the Tesla standard, a North American charging center. I've wondered, well, would Tesla, would this happen beyond the US? Like in mm -hmm. Europe, there's a bit of this going on because I think because Tesla basically had to have open chargers to qualify for new locations for superchargers. So it's like if they want to keep growing in good locations and get permits, they have to be more open. Um, and just they use the same charging standard as everyone else in Europe anyway because of regulations there. In the U.S., is a different story. It's like all of a sudden everybody's going to adopt Teslas, and then you see this semi-monopoly Tesla can create, and you're like, oh, like this is a potentially big business for Tesla. Will it do this beyond the U.S.? And so we're seeing some of it in South Korea. I don't really know why or or if it's business driven or if it's got regulation driven, but I don't know. What do you think about Tesla sort of trying to? rope in other well, EVs beyond the North America and Europe. I think it's easier in Korea because don't they use the um don't they use CCS in Korea? They probably do, but I'm not I'm not sure. I, I believe I'm almost you. positive you, that you they, they do. do. I believe you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm almost positive that they do. It was really interesting too because in it, I was having a conversation with somebody at Audi about how in Japan they still use the Chatmo standard. Yeah. So they're building vehicles that are CCS and Chatmo for Japan. So like, it, it's just a reminder that there is more to the planet than the United States of America, which as a kid who was raised in America is kind of a shocker to me, but it's still very interesting. But no, I, I think it's, um you know, it's all part of Tesla's plan. And I what I really like about this, going back to Jennifer's piece, is that this charging station has some architecture to it. Yeah, this is. I think this is in California. It's gorgeous. Like the stock photo from Tesla. I think that still looks good. 
<clears throat> but yeah, it does have nice architecture and solar panels probably on top. Um, yeah, but what do you think about Tesla kind of potentially getting having a dominant role in EV charging around the world? I mean, I mean, it's proven. I to don't know. It it's have reliable, abundant charging. Station. Well, because they own it, right? Because they own that experience. They take it on and they they make that kind of choice to to maintain the connections, to run the software. They do all that. They don't do it like ChargePoint, which basically just sells you the hardware and, you know, hope for the best. They don't do it in the same way that, um, not to pick on people, but some of these charging companies just kind of leave it up to you and they say, well, the CPO is responsible for maintenance. Well, I, I, I don't know about that. I don't think that that's how you end up with a quality experience. You end up with a quality experience when you control the experience and when you put some care and love into it. And I think Tesla has done that with its charging station. I think the real question, the real challenge is going to be, you know, where does that put Tesla five years from now, 10 years from now? Because if you talk about Tesla as a stock, right? Tesla's stock is priced like a tech company. It's not, not priced like a charging company. It's not priced like a utility. It's not priced like a car company. So if it does become the charging standard, if it does start to look more like a charging company, basically at some point, it's going to have to be pigeonholed into some other category than what it is once it becomes clear that it's not going to be a robo taxi company. And then the share price is going to do what the share price does. And, uh, you know, that's how we justify the title being Tesla share price tanking. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will leave the other topics, but I think one big thing it has, it has capital. So it does have capital. Absolutely. This is a, this is a big part of this. That's sort of, I think often just not really thought about or noticed is Tesla has so much money, so much money. It can just keep growing the charging stations It's part of the, the, it's part of the business. It's part of what it's, you know, what is doing to stimulate sales is a big part of it. Yep. And it's a part of what it uses those, the profits it makes. I mean, the money it makes to do. And outside of that, you have, you have government subsidies, government funding, which is always limited. It has its drawbacks. It's the government. I mean, the government is not the best at building a profitable, great business on its own. So you can't just Oh, the Philippines is going to put a lot of money in for charging stations. So they're going to have a great charging network. No, there's going to be companies that build charging stations and take the money. And then well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, then... I have a real problem with this. I, I have a real problem with that concept. The idea that government exists to generate profitable businesses, it, it, it's, it's really kind of nonsensical. And I'm going to go back to like, you know, you, you see all this propaganda about the post office isn't profitable and things like that. Of course not. It's a service. You know, we don't talk about whether or not the military is profitable. We don't talk about whether or not public school is profitable. It has nothing to do with that. This is part of the service. This is part of providing a usable, workable infrastructure that allows people and commerce to take place within the borders of the country. It doesn't have to be profitable. It has to serve the needs of the people. So I, yeah, I, I don't there's... know. So there's two, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. There's so the other approach has been this sort of semi public private thing going yeah. on where, where the governments try to stimulate the market to create these, but then you get suboptimal charging stands, charging networks and stations that aren't reliable. And then you also have the, the, the charging companies, which are doing their best. They're trying to grow. They're trying to provide a good service, but they don't have the capital Tesla has, and they will that's go right. bankrupt if they do it well. And they will not do it. They will not. People won't be happy if they don't do it well, but they don't have the money to not do it well at the scale needed. I mean, to do it well at the scale needed. So you have this dilemma and where we're sort of headed. It's, it's kind of a case of like, well, does Tesla end up with a semi monopoly on charging a lot of places because it can do it well and everything else is just going to fail? And if that's the case, I mean, maybe we should just get cut to the chase and realize this is a this is a, a public utility prone to monopolization that maybe should just be publicly funded utility like electricity like power like uh like water and you know instead of a so you're saying to, we should nationalize the supercharging well, set i'm just saying there's two different ways oh. to go here in my opinion that are that are quite effective one is 
end up leaving companies to have a semi-monopoly and see where that goes. The, the, the failed approach of like, you know, subsidies for, for suboptimal networks, I don't think is very good. Or, you know, you just say like, okay, the government's putting in charging stations in mass so that everybody can drive EVs like they did with roads, like they do with roads, you know, and, yeah. uh, and just make it a public utility. So those are kind of the, the options. If, if it becomes a semi-monopoly, then you're going to have the issue of uh, how do you make it fair? How do you break it up? How do you make sure Tesla's not overcharging people? Like at some point, if Tesla's dominating EV charging networks in a bunch of countries, it can make huge profits on the charging networks if it decides, hey, we're we're increasing prices 50%. And where else are you going to charge when you need to visit grandma? You know, so it's like, it, you know, Google had the don't be evil mantra for years and then became a giant corporation and got rid of the don't be evil mantra. Like, like it just happened. So whatever Tesla is, you know, if it comes about with, a te- you know, the situation, like what's going to happen? I don't know. But that's very good points. I, I think they need to be addressed. Um, but I, I don't know, man. People I, I think it's, rate. well, no, I think we're a long way from that. I think, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we get the the blinders on and we think of Tesla as like this huge monolith in the, in the automotive space, but there's still what five, 6% of the total market. I mean, the yeah. One positive thing is most charging can be done at a slow speed uh, easily and the, without right. needing, you know, fast chargers, but yeah, let's, so more on expansion. We have just a couple more stories. I think um, so uh, Volkswagen has struggled to keep its position in the Chinese auto market as the auto market has electrified. This has been one of the big problems it's been facing. Uh, potentially the number one reason why Herbert Dice got uh, removed from CEO of Volkswagen Group. Um, and so, I mean, just struggling. And as I show in this article, like the Chinese EV market is dominated by Chinese EV brands. Like the top 20 is all Chinese automakers and Tesla, which is arguably half Chinese automaker because it's the biggest factories in China. Um, So, and it's, you know, the Chinese factories serving the Chinese market. So it's really just all, you know, I mean, of course, Volkswagen, similar kind of approach. They're going to try to build the cars in China, but it's just struggled to break through and to do well. It doesn't have the most high tech EVs like all these other companies mostly, you know, have either high tech, good software EVs or cheap, super cheap EVs. So it's like its approach seems to be we can make super cheap EVs too. That's how we're going to grow market in China. What do you think? I think Volkswagen is struggling because Volkswagen has been trying to make this transition into being thought of as a premium brand. And they've kind of been successful on the SUV front, but they haven't really pulled it off in America and China really outside of a lot of markets, they haven't really pulled it off. I don't think anybody really considers a Volkswagen to be on the same level as a Mercedes Benz or a BMW. I know I certainly don't. I think the software experience, the ownership experience is not as good as you get from other brands, certainly not as good as Tesla. And uh, I, I just don't think the vehicle itself is there. So I think, you know, they can talk about making cheaper Volkswagens for China. They can talk about making cheaper Volkswagen EVs. But I think in general, Volkswagen just needs to accept that it's not a premium brand. It doesn't have that premium brand value. And it needs to get back to basics and building vehicles that people can afford. Because the kind of people who want Volkswagens and like Volkswagens, they're not spending $70,000 on a Volkswagen sedan. They didn't do it 20 years ago with the Fayette, and then they're not going to do it today. Uh, there's the history nugget. Should we go go down a history road? I'm, we I'm absolutely curious to can. hear that. So Piek in the 90s, and he was the CEO of Volkswagen Group in the 90s, he had, there was a huge problem with Audi in North America in the early 90s with unintended acceleration lawsuits. You saw a little bit of that with the Prius early on, but Audi is really the one that that made that famous. The cars would launch off the line, really low end torque. They would, you know, rear end people. They would have fires. It was a real big issue. And Audi had a terrible brand name and a brand image problem. And Piek had the idea that it would be easier for Volkswagen to move up market than it would be for Audi to essentially maintain and grow as a premium brand. So he started making more premium Volkswagens. It started with the Passat, um, which was a, a luxurious 
for Volkswagen vehicle in the 90s, the first gen Passat, then the Corrado, which was a sporty vehicle that was meant to kind of be a competitor to the base to the top end 924 Porsches and the base level 944s. And this was really a push to drive Volkswagen up market. The theory being that it would be easier to sell an expensive Volkswagen than it would be to sell an expensive Audi. And that just didn't play out. The Audi brand kind of went from strength to strength. The original A4 was considered a design masterpiece. The TT really launched this whole trend of retro styling that eventually led to the Volkswagen New Beetle, the Ford Thunderbird remake, the entire 2004 to 2024 Ford Mustang line that is just a rehash of the 68 classic. So a lot of that didn't play out, but there is still this belief with people who were loyal to Piek and people who came up through the company ranks in that era that VW should be a premium brand, that VW should grow and be considered a, a valuable PR driven, desirable, aspirational brand. And they keep pushing this stuff. The ID7 is a great example of this. They are trying to get $60,000, $70,000 for a sedan that is not pretty. It doesn't seem to be technologically super advanced. The only thing it really has going for it is the VW brand name. And I don't know a single person who's willing to pay a premium for a VW brand. So it, the whole thing is a mess. They needed new leadership. It looks like they got some new leadership at the top, but it's going to take some time for reality to set in from the VP level down. And once it finally does, we can probably get back to building rabbits and golfs and beetles that people can actually afford and buy. Yeah, that's a really interesting. It was a bit of a throwback because my first car was an, a 1990 Audi that I bought in 1999, I think. So... I was like a fan. I like I loved Audis. I was I I thought, but they were quite uncommon at that point. And the car I bought, oh, yeah, they were very rare, very uncommon. And it's funny that I was drawn to it because later on, when I married a European and lived in Europe, I saw this car everywhere. But the car gave me a horrible time because I was an idiot to buy a nine-year-old Audi from yeah. the doctor family whose son I babysat, and uh, they knew it. I I feel like. I can remember him giving me the papers for the car when I bought it. My, and I can feel I can feel him saying, "Sorry." <laughs> he, it was, well, he was like, had, "Look, if you really want this, I'll sell it to you." But uh, like, we'll... like, like uh, we just changed the brakes, so that's good. And I was like, "Oh, that's a good sign." No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I learned. Well, I think I learned the record. Every you, time nobody stuff... should buy a nine-year-old Audi. Even no, today, nobody should buy a nine-year-old Audi. Especially when nobody has an Audi and you don't see another version of this uh, this model anywhere on the road. Was it a was it a ninety or a one hundred? It was an eighty. It was the model was an Audi. Okay, the Audi eighty. All right. Yeah, Those were decent cars. They yeah, were some of the. But first every time car something first. broke, yeah, it cost me a fortune to fix it. Oh the yeah. Good, the good thing is it turned me into uh, biking. I mean, well, my a girlfriend turned me into biking for transportation, a concept as a Floridian I didn't know existed. I was like, wow, you right. can bike places for transportation. So I started doing that. And every time my car broke and I couldn't afford to fix it because the parts were ridiculously expensive for an old Audi that nobody had, uh, then I would bike for transportation and I liked it more. And eventually I was like, I like it more, but every time I fix my car, I, I slowly start driving places more. So eventually right. I was like, just get rid of the car. So I lived car free after that for 15 years. So I can thank Audi and its approach to trying to, to or this whole thing that you're describing, leaving Audi behind in the US to try to make Volkswagen a luxury brand because of this history I had no, no knowledge of. And like, because it just left Audi behind, you know, I was paying a fortune to fix uh, anything, a, a broken muffler, whatever. And uh, but it's interesting. And then I remember when they tried to bring Audi back with like the James Bond <laughs> coming back to James Bond. <laughs> so third episode. Love running. the James. But Bond they tried talk. to re revive the Audi brand, you know, in the U.S. And it's like, oh yeah, why not? Why would why would they leave the Audi brand behind? Because when I was, you know, I loved Audi and BMW. Those were the, the brands I loved in college, and until I got very anti car, very car free. But yeah, I to my point, which without all that history, with this was like. Okay, Volkswagen is not doing well with software. They're not doing well establishing themselves as a competitor with Tesla, BYD, Neo, Xpeng. They're not competing. 
So maybe it's just time they realize, hey, what can we do? We can produce cheap cars cheaply. We can produce cars at scale. We can use our manufacturing expertise globally, our brand to produce good, cheap cars. And it seems like that's the approach, just realizing this is who we are. This is what we need to do in China and maybe beyond. And, you know, we also had stories in the U.S., a cheaper Volkswagen coming. So it seems like that's the big move it's making. Okay, we're not going to compete anymore. We're not going to be competing in this market we tried to compete in. Let's just get to doing the basics, the rabbit, you know, our, our history with the Golf of being a really good, cheap car maker, right? So it seems like you said the same thing. I'm, I'm happy to hear it because we sort of come at it from different windows. But I think uh, same thing, right? I think especially in the United States, there's this idea that a mainstream brand is bad. Every brand has to be premium. Every brand has to be aspirational. And it's not just cars, right? I mean, when I was a kid, the champion sweaters and the champion shoes were what you got at, you know, that's what you got at Payless shoes. And it was like the cheap, you know, discount brand. And then with so many people came up wearing that and became basketball stars and football stars that uh, the brand became now something that's more desirable and aspirational. But this whole idea that every brand has to be premium and value and aspirational is really kind of a strange thing considering everybody's broken. We have fewer savings now than we have in three generations. Yeah. And I, I mean, in Europe, it sort of maximized that because everyone is like, Oh, a Volkswagen is actually really good at a really good price, you know? So yes. a lot of people have the golf and like the golf is everywhere. The Passat, It's just a very popular brand because it's seen as almost luxury at a really good price. And it's like really good quality, really reliable, really great cars at a really good price. And I think it just has to emphasize that at a really good price again. And it seems like that's what it's trying to do. So exactly right. And really good price can't be, man, it's, you know, 90% as good as a Mercedes E-Class for 85% of the price. No, it has to be 80% as good for half the price. Yeah, good one. There we go. That's the show. Thanks, Joe. Have a good post-Thanksgiving week. We'll see you soon for another episode. A couple of days. See you guys on Wednesday. Later.